We are very lucky to have five admissions representatives here with us tonight to talk to you about the process from their perspective, as well as Mrs. Bino, who will share some information from the Walpole High School perspective as well. I'd like to welcome Mr. O'Toole, who will be your moderator for this evening. We will have some time for questions at the end, so enjoy. Good evening. Um, we're fortunate to have five representatives here from five different colleges. Um, we, we have, if they could maybe just wave their hand, because I don't, I don't know if I'll get the order correct here. Um, Kelly Bellavance, who's the Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions at Boston College. Caitlin Havener, who's the Assistant Director of Admissions at Nichols College. Nathan Menacher, the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Admissions at UMass Boston. Catherine Neely, the Senior Regional Admissions Coordinator at University of South Carolina. And Daisy Ogonado, the Admissions Counselor from UMass Lowell. So let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Despite what we all think, the admissions representatives are actually very kind and helpful <laughs> and willing to volunteer to do things like this and even answer your kids' questions along the way. Um, so keep that in mind when, when you picture what they actually are in their role. Um, let's just start out by uh, giving them a chance to give us an introduction of themselves and their institutions. Uh, if we can start maybe with Catherine here on this end. Good evening, everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Nate. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes? okay, just wanted to double check. Uh, my name is Nate, I'm from UMass Boston. I'm the Assistant Director for Undergraduate Admissions. Uh, my territory is the South Shore of Massachusetts and Rhode Island and some other states in the West. Um, in terms of UMass Boston, it's located on Columbia Point. Uh, so if you're familiar with the Boston area, that is in Dorchester neighborhood. Uh, some defining features of our campus uh, is the fact that uh, since we're on a peninsula, we are still removed from the city, but we're also very close to the city. We have our own T-stop, uh, the JFK UMass stop, uh, which is about three stops from uh, downtown crossing. So you still get access to the city while still being a little bit removed and having that quintessential residential college experience. Um, up until this year, we were 100% uh, commuter school, but we are opening our first residence hall for fall 2018. So you all in fall 2019 will be the second uh, year of tenants in that room or in that building if you attend UMass Boston. Hi, my name is Daisy Ogonado from UMass Lowell. I'm an admissions counselor. My territory is South Shore, Mass, as well as Rhode, I uh, Rhode Island. Yeah, so I'll be seeing him Same a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you guys. Um, I'm actually a local resident of Fox River, Massachusetts. Go Warriors. So I know a lot <laughs> about this area and what you guys are like. So at UMass Lowell, we are part of the UMass system, which is made up of five schools, um, four of them being undergraduate, um, graduate doctorate programs, and then UMass Medical, which is where you would go on to get a medical degree. Um, so UMass Lowell, it, we're all very unique schools. I like to say that we're kind of like siblings. We have the same parents, but we're completely different people. Um, so that means you apply to us differently, and we have different programs that we offer. But we're really close, so don't worry about that. There's no rivalry, except in sports. <laughs> so at UMass Lowell, we are made up of three um, 
small campuses, our North Campus, our South Campus, and our East Campus, which makes us really unique. People always ask about West Campus, but it doesn't exist, um, which is really unfortunate. But we have a lot of different housing options for students. We're located in the urban community of Lowell, Massachusetts, which is, I think, the fourth largest city in Massachusetts. If you haven't been before, I definitely suggest taking a tour because we have changed a good deal in the past decade or so. Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Bellavance. I am from Boston College. I'm actually my 12th year working in the admission office at Boston College and my 17th year in admissions overall. Time goes by fast. Um, <laughs> at Boston College, we are about 9,000 undergraduate students, and we are split into four undergraduate divisions, um, arts and sciences, business, education, and nursing. We're about six miles west of downtown Boston, so our location gives our students kind of the best of both worlds in terms of a very traditional self-enclosed campus, but also all of the opportunities of Boston very close by. We also have our own T-stop um, at the end of one of the Green Line branches. Um, take that, UMass Boston. Um, so <laughs> when he said that, I thought, that sounds kind of cool. And then I was like, wait a minute, we have the same thing. You can tell how often I use the T. Um, so we do have our own T-stop, and easy access into the city for our students. We are a division one school for athletics. We have over 300 different clubs and activities and we are a Catholic and Jesuit institution. So lots of great stuff happening in Chestnut Hill. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Havner. I'm the Assistant Director of Admission at Nichols College. We are a very small private school located in the rolling hills of Dudley, Massachusetts. How many of you are familiar with Dudley's location? A few of you, a lot of you, <laughs> awesome. So we are about 20 minutes outside of Worcester. That would probably be our best way to describe us, just south of Worcester. But we're also about 40 minutes outside of Providence, Rhode Island, about 40 minutes outside of Hartford, Connecticut. So really great opportunities in terms of internships and postgraduate. Uh, there's many different cities that our students are able to pull from geographically in terms of their next step post Nichols. So uh, we are a private institution with 1,200 students, so very, very small. And we are primarily known for business. But I always like mentioning we have an array of wonderful liberal arts programs as well, um, which is pretty great for our students who are interested uh, in the liberal arts field because they are getting kind of those studies in a business surrounding an environment. So there is still a strong focus on professional development, resume building, all the things that our business students are, business students are also focusing on. Thanks. Um, and we can we can come back the other way. There's a lot of you, which is great. Um, could you just let us know what is the profile of a typical applicant to your institution? Do you want me to begin? Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Uh, Let's so, give you a break. Okay, sure. So we don't. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. So we don't have a set GPA per se of what we're exactly looking for in terms of our student. I would say we have a wide array of GPAs. We, on average, range between a 2.6 and a 3.5. Our incoming class uh, for the fall 2017 cohort was a 2.9 GPA. Um, we uh, primarily see students applying through the common application, though we do have a Nichols College application as well. Uh, we have no application fee and many different ways to apply, which we can kind of go through that process. I know we have a question about some deadlines and things. Uh, we're also a test flexible school, which I'll get into. Um, at Boston College, in order to be competitive in our applicant pool, students need to be taking advantage of the most challenging curriculum available at their school. So at your school here, um, taking advantage of the AP courses that are offered. Um, students also need to be falling in the high percentages of their class. And um, most schools don't provide rank anymore, but usually comfortably within the top 10% of a class makes a more competitive applicant to Boston College. We also look for depth in a curriculum. Um, so in a perfect world, students would take five, four years of the five academic subjects in grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, in terms of GPA, like I said, students need to be falling in the high percentages of their class to be competitive to Boston College. Unfortunately, we don't have an average GPA to report to families because we don't recalculate a GPA when we review a file for admission. And schools across the country and throughout the world use various grading scales. And so we're looking at each applicant in the environment that they come from, what curriculum is available at their school, what have they taken advantage of, what's the grading scale at that school, where does a student fall, and then in addition to all of those academic factors, also looking at um, all of the other things in the application, your recommendations, your essays, your written supplements, and um, your extracurricular activities to get a sense of who you are as a person outside of the classroom as well. 
So what we're looking for in a student is a student with a strong B average with an SAT above an 1130. I would say an ACT around 22. Our averages for last year were 3.6 with an SAT of around 1240. So very similar to UMass Lowell. Uh, for UMass Boston, the typical student, um, since we are primarily a commuter school right now, our students mainly come from the greater Boston area. Uh, in terms of GPA and test scores, our recalculated GPA um, hovers around a 3.2, 3.3, depending on the year, and an average SAT score of about 11, uh, 1140, and ACT score of about 24. At South Carolina, when you're looking at the academics, uh, we do recalculate GPA, I'd say typically a strong B plus A minus student um, based on our recalculation. For the SAT scores, a 1200 to 1340 and a 25 to 30 on the ACT. We do not require the writing sections of either. Um, when we're looking, you know, in addition to that, we're looking for different characteristics that define a student, um, your involvement in your community, uh, within your school system, holding down a job, uh, whatever your kind of passions um, and areas of engagement that you've truly enjoyed being a part of are the things that we're looking for. My boss likes to say that finding that perfectly well-rounded student is a mythical being. It's like looking for a unicorn but we're trying to make a well-rounded student body. So you have something to contribute to our campus, and those are the pieces that we're looking for. For anyone out there who might be wondering how the Walpole GPA is calculated, uh, we use a weighted 4.0 system, which just means that if you're taking an honors or an AP class, you're gonna get extra points factored into your GPA for that. And when we calculate GPA, we're only calculating uh, weighted classes, so anything CP2, CP1, honors, and AP. Thank you. Um, just to shift gears back to the search process, because I think we're at the forefront of that. We'll get into all this scary other stuff in a minute. Um, and, and this question is for any one of you, and if someone else wants to jump in and add, that's great. Um, with regard to the college process itself, as we sit here in January of uh, our students' junior year, um, where should their focus be right now? Any of anyone wants it? Um, I think most students at this point are trying to figure out what majors they're looking at and whether or not they're looking at a major at all. So, you know, I tell a lot of students that undecided is probably the most popular major at any university. Um, so, don't be embarrassed if your first year you're still not sure what you're trying to do. You'll figure that out eventually. I'm sure a lot of us did. So, at this point, you're trying to figure out what colleges are out there and what they have to offer. Um, and then I would say, pretty much by senior year, you should have your list now narrowed down so you know kind of exactly who you want to talk to at college fairs or visits and so on and so forth. I would, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I would, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. You can go. Okay. <laughs> In addition to that, <laughs> Um, I would say, you know, as you're starting to look at the spring and the summer um, coming down the road, start thinking about the type of campus that you want to be at. And you have so many institutions in your backyard to start exploring and navigating. They don't necessarily have to be the schools you think you're interested in, but start visiting different types of schools. Go to a big school, a small school, a rural school, an urban school, and start noticing what you like about those schools when you're on their campus. What are the different characteristics you like? Um, what are the things that you don't like? Because those are the those little identifiers that are going to help you when you do start noticing, OK, I'm thinking maybe these fields, or I know I like these characteristics. And it can help you start narrowing and shaping, shaving down um, the type of place that you want to be geographically where you need to be. Um, I know, for in instance, coming from a school that's further away, um, many students don't visit our campus until their senior year um, unless they have found out about our campus very early on because we are a plane right away um, but that doesn't mean you can't visit schools that are in your backyard that have some of those same defining characteristics um, as you'll find in other states I'm just kind of picking up off of what Catherine said the the earlier you can visit the better it's definitely recommended especially for those local schools you know the discovery point is kind of where I 
envision juniors being right now and the online search tool is great um, but you could spend all day searching online and not actually taking in what you could be taking in at a college campus while students are in session so at many small institutions they pretty much close up shop during the summertime they don't have a lot of students on campus in the summer and um, while the summer visit is great you might be missing out a little bit on the student body at least at a smaller institution so definitely recommend getting outside of your backyard kind of area and visiting what's within a one hour radius of you and then plan the summertime for those you know maybe those trips down south or maybe those trips out to the west coast to then see some of those other schools that are the plane right away our juniors and seniors are also allowed two days each year to do these college visits so we agree that students have to get out and see these schools and if you can get to them when class is in session to get a real um, I guess like taste of life at that school we want you to be able to go and you're able to take those two days each year as excused absences uh, and I, I think we've we've kind of carried over to the next question I wanted to ask is kind of uh, we're talking about the parts of the search and these are the things we're going to talk with the students with in a couple of weeks in the classroom you know what's really important um, what you're inclined toward for studying you don't need to know your major um, there's a lot of kids that are undecided um, and a lot of students that change majors from application to um, when they graduate um, but what you're what you're thinking of studying location surrounding sort sort of some of these things um, I don't know if the panel are there other things that you would say any other tips regarding students finding their ideal college or university or the right fit um, I always like to tell students to kind of to the extent possible kind of tune out the noise about this process and really just kind of follow your gut I think that the older we get, it's so much easier to listen to your instincts. That's a skill that's sometimes harder when you're a teenager in high school. But your instincts are there for a reason and they lead you the right way. And you may really like a school and you might hear your friends or someone else make a comment about that that's not positive and then you think, huh. But if you really liked it, that's what matters because you're gonna be there living for those four years. So I think, you know, sometimes this process can get very laborious and, and anxiety ridden. And the more that you can, again, focus on those instincts and trust your gut and just follow that through this, it will lead you in the right direction. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people here are, there's one part of the search we're not really talking about and that's value. Um, the right fit has to be a school a student can afford um, or a family can afford. Uh, if given that all a lot of us are always concerned about financing our students college education, do you have any suggestions as to how to incorporate value into their search? I think it's really important to sit down with your parents and have that conversation about what you can afford and where you can afford to go um, because I feel like that's something that I was remiss in doing when I was a student. I just said, I'm going to college and then it wasn't until I was walking through the doors that I said, how am I going to pay for this? Um, so it's really important to go to as many, um, have as many conversations with your parents, go to as many classes that teach you about how to pay for college, look up as many scholarships as you can because there is lots of money out there that's hiding. And then really think about how much those schools cost. And even though it might have a high bill immediately, you're not sure how many scholarships they have to offer. There's a lot of private schools, even though I'm coming from the public school side, that they might have a high cost, but when you think, when you hear from an admissions counselor, hey, we shave off $10,000 immediately once you apply, or something like that. So have that conversation with the admissions counselors, talk to the financial aid reps, do what you can before making an informed decision. I'd say start considering what your goals are. Um, you know, are you going to stop at a bachelor's degree or do you really want to pursue a master's or a professional program? Um, because if you are thinking of professional schools, then uh, maybe you start to reconsider how you're choosing to spend that um, investment for your undergraduate education. So maybe you do um, receive a high scholarship or you're admitted into an honors college or an honors program um, at a school that maybe wasn't quite your top choice for your undergraduate school, but if that tuition's covered for for your undergraduate expenses, then you have um, a more to spend and invest when you're trying to pursue that next step and your next step goal. 
Um, I'd also add there's a really great book called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be by Frank Bruni. And um, he spends, I think, a whole chapter discussing um, kind of depending on what you're interested in majoring and the career path. Um, that you're pursuing. Sometimes a, you know, a highly selective school is a good fit, but sometimes your local flagship institutions um, are better suited for what you want to go into afterwards based on the networking opportunities that those, um, that, that particular institution can provide. So um, it's not just the next four years, but start thinking and planning for further down the line because there are certainly further financial implications that can arise after your four years. I think it's also important to consider community colleges as well, particularly being a state school like UMass Boston, I'm sure UMass Lowell. We accept a lot of students from uh, the local community colleges. So if you are particularly undecided and don't know exactly where you want to go um, and don't want to pay that high sticker price to take general education coursework, um, you could do that at the community college level and then transfer in once you have a better sense of which major, which career track is uh, best suited for you. So that's another thing when you're particularly talking about value to keep in mind. And um, don't let anyone uh, downplay or talk down about going to a community college. It is definitely worth uh, the money. Thank you. Um, and just to go back towards admissions decisions in each institution here, what do you guys see as like the most important factors? I know you talked about um, a little bit about GPA, recalculated GPA or not. SAT, ACT scores, um, that's why we have scattergrams so we don't have to write all that stuff down. Um, but what do you see as the most important factors in determining whether or not to admit an applicant? So at Nichols College, it's definitely about an upward trajectory and seeing a really strong junior and senior year. Um, we're far more likely to take a chance on a student that we might otherwise not uh, if we see that they're continuing to grow each year because we understand when you're 14 years old and you're a freshman in high school is far different than when you're 17 years old and getting ready for your career and your next step and going to college. Um, it's more of a red flag to see that kind of slippery slope that starts in the junior year and then it's hard to pump the brakes on that and through your senior year and you're just watching that kind of don't give up basically. That's what we're really looking for. And we also really love the students who kind of dig into their application search. Um, you know, take the time to get to know the institutions that you're seriously applying to because I think it really goes a long way. This is a first investment that you'll make of many future investments. You know, many people wouldn't buy a house without going into the open houses. So go to the open houses, talk to the professors, have lunch in the dining hall, do all those extra steps that you might not have to do on a college tour, but the admissions counselors are paying attention to that. And we're definitely seeing when you're taking that one step further. I always tell families and, and students that at the heart of this admission process, this is an academic competition. So your academic record, your standardized test scores for schools that require them, those things will always carry the most weight in the review. Aside from that, the reality is your academic record, it's important, but it's kind of boring. It's just classes, it's grades, it's test scores. The meat of your application is the other stuff. It's, it's what you write in your essay. It's, it's what your teachers and counselors write about you. It's what you've done with your time outside the classroom. That's what makes an applicant come alive as a person when we read the application. And I think that oftentimes in this process, students feel that when they submit an application to colleges, they're left with this feeling that there's so much more to me than what's encapsulated here. And that's true, there is so much more to you. The, the admission process is not meant to encapsulate you as an entire person. We're getting a glimpse into that. And so as you go through your application, you wanna make sure that you're giving us the best tools and the best glimpse into who you are as a person. Um, thinking about what you wanna write your essay about, thinking about what teachers will write you the strongest letters of recommendation. Maybe it's not the teacher where you got the best grade, maybe it's a class where you struggled a little bit, and you went in for extra help or you advocated for yourself and you really stuck with it, that's going to be a much more compelling letter of recommendation. So aside from the academic stuff, the most compelling thing can come through in lots of different ways in an application. And, and the great thing about doing the holistic review that we all do in reading all of our applications is that we get to read everything that you submitted to us and, and that tells us a little bit more about who you are. 
when you feel like this process isn't adequately representing you, trust in the process. Because one of the things that I've learned in my years at admission is that the tools that we require and ask for really do give us what we need to evaluate you for admission. So just trust in that process, give us the tools we need, and what is compelling about you will come through in that application. Well put. Um, before, as we're jumping into, uh, do you have something to add? Oh, thanks. Um, That's nice. Oh. Uh, what, while we're getting to our two UMass representatives, one or both of you can take this one, but could you provide a brief overview of like the state standards for Massachusetts? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the Massachusetts state standards are um, a group of 17 courses that you need to have in order to be reviewed for admissions. So those, those are four years of math, four years of English, three years of a lab science, two years of social sciences, uh, one must be U.S. history, uh, two years of the same foreign language, which includes American Sign Language, and then two electives. Now, those electives tend to be uh, some of those other subjects I just mentioned, but they can also be in computer science, technology, engineering, um, the fine arts, uh, like sculpting or something. Um, so there's a lot more <laughs> leeway with, uh, uh, with the electives, um, but those are the 17 core academic standards that are set by the Board of Higher Education of, for the state of Massachusetts. And parents don't panic, our core requirements at the high school are very similar, so. Yeah, it's usually <laughs> Most high schools have <laughs> um, Speaking about requirements, uh, let's talk about our favorite thing, testing. Um, could you, each of you, talk about your testing requirements for admissions? Um, I know you might have mentioned them, but some, I think we do have at least one test optional school or two here, so you could get into that too, but every, just your testing requirements in general. Um. Um, so at South Carolina, we do require test scores. Uh, we have no preference whether you submit the SAT or ACT or you submit both. Uh, we will utilize your highest test score. Within the SAT sections for the evidence-based reading and math, we will super score across tests to provide you the greatest advantage. We do not require the writing piece for either test. With the ACT, however, we only look at the composite score since that test is taken in one sitting. Can I just say ditto for Boston College? Save some time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, yes. So, ditto. <laughs> UMass Boston is test optional. Um, however, if you are interested in pursuing uh, our nursing program, you will still have to submit uh, your test scores. Um, we do accept both the SAT and the ACT, uh, and you do not need to do the essay portion for either test. Uh, the ACT, we only use the composite. The SAT, we do super score. So we'll take the best of uh, both sections if you take it multiple times. So ditto to what he said, we are also test optional. The difference is that we also accept test optional for nursing students. The caveat being that nursing students do have to apply by early action. You cannot apply any later because it is our most competitive pool. In addition, our test optional is basically if you have above a 3.25 GPA or higher, hopefully more closer to that 3.5, all you have to do is answer three short answer essay questions and you're reviewed much more holistically. So we take you to a committee and decide if what you you've shown us as a student, not just your grades, but also your background and who you are and what you've done, um, you know, would make a good fit for the school. So I'm going to be a wild card. We're test flexible. So <laughs> that means for us, if a student has at least a 3.0 GPA or higher, you are welcome to waive them. However, we encourage students who have done really well on ACTs or SATs to submit them. So if you received a 1200 on your two-way split of your SAT, send that to us because it can really help you get merit-based scholarship. We are an institution who um, offers a lot of great merit scholarship, anywhere from seven to $19,000. We also accept the ACT as well, so that's an opportunity for you to consider too. We will take both. Um, we use the concordance table to go back and forth and determine what's the best score overall. If you're under a 3.0, we require SATs if you do not want to interview with us. So you could have a chance to actually display your candidacy in the form of an interview. Uh, you could do that if you're an over a 3.0 as well, but we need to see something so you can't just check a box off saying you're not sending us scores because we will call you for an interview. And, and while a fan of test optional myself because a lot of students aren't really represented well by the standardized testing, um, it does it is kind of confusing but just so you know in general I think they kind of said different things but along the same lines um, students that are applying to schools that are test optional 
can utilize their counselors a little bit because we can help them decide and, and navigate. You know, you don't want to send a score if it might hurt you, and you want to send a score if you're above average for that particular college's pool. And, and that can be a little tricky, although the colleges, to their credit, I think on their websites, if they are test optional, have been very, very descriptive. So students just go there, and it usually lays it out pretty clearly. Um, along with testing, uh, do you guys have any suggestions for students planning? For example, which test should they take? How many times should they take it? That kind of stuff. Don't take it eight times. No. <laughs> yeah. At that point, it's you know. Yeah, I, I think there's actually data out there, particularly from the College Board, about the SAT, that once you take it twice, to take it more than that is just diminishing returns. You're not likely to increase much more after that. Um, I think there's validity sometimes in taking it twice, especially if you're an anxious test taker, if you're just nervous about these standardized tests because you feel like this is weighing on you and is going to define your future. It's not going to, but I think students feel that way a lot of the times, and so there's a lot of anxiety around that. And I think sometimes just taking the test once and getting a little bit comfort with the timing, the process, the questions, the, the, the format can really lead to a calmer experience the second time, which allows you to do better, um, especially after you take the SAT the first time, then they will provide you with um, free prep through Khan Academy on the sections that you struggled with, and that can be really helpful to improve your score the second time around. So I think, you know, if you kind of plan on taking it twice, I think most students, and you guys probably know better than us, but, you know, probably in the spring of their junior year and again in the fall of their senior year, that's a good plan of attack. They are offering an August se session now yeah. for the SAT, so mm -hmm. way to spend a fun day in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> so. And really plan accordingly when you're taking these tests because you don't want the deadline to be February 1st and your ACT is scheduled for February 1st yeah. because at that point you've missed the deadline. So really think about, you know, when am I going to take the SATs? Definitely the schedule of summer, of, like spring and summer of junior year and fall of senior year is the best fit. Mm -hmm. And in terms of which test to take, there, I mean, there's some stylistic differences between the two, um, but they're basically, they're testing the same thing. So you can just pick whichever one. Here on the East Coast, the SAT is much more popular uh, than the ACT. Um, if you head west, the ACT is much more popular than the SAT. So uh, there's no real difference when it comes to which one to pick. Thank you. Uh, if students are interested in sampling the ACT and the SAT, we, we generally encourage they do that a little earlier in the process, uh, in the testing window, because that way they have time to evaluate which one they liked better or which one favored them as they plan forward. Um, so just, just a heads up on that. Um, in terms of um, the next thing, and hopefully students are attacking this a little bit over the summer, um, that would be filling out an application. Do you guys have any suggestions for a student who's filling out an application? Uh, and we could continue right into the essay as well, or we can do it separately. I want to say for schools that are on the Common App, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're yeah, all yep. on the Common App? Great. Um, no, easy. I, nope, nope just kidding. Um, for those of us that are on the Common App, I always suggest using the Common App because it does give us a lot more information than about who you are. Because I know for, our, for a fact that our application basically says, what's your name and what's your social security number? And that's pretty much all I get from you besides your essay. Um, so really put some thought into your application. Please, please, please do not write it on your cell phone. I've definitely seen that done before. And I know technology is convenient, but really take the time to write your common application. Make sure you've capitalized your first and last name and that things are <laughs> spelled correctly. And make sure that you review each school's portion of the common app so that you're not missing anything. Because you don't want to apply test optional or not apply test optional to, say, us or UMass Boston and then realize that you accidentally did one or the other and then you're calling and we're like no you can't switch sorry it's too late mm -hmm. so really take the time when you're reviewing your common app and then use the essay section to really talk about who you are as a person I like to tell students like if you're gonna talk about sports I don't want to hear about the big game it doesn't mean anything to me because I'm not a big sports person. But if you tell me about what the big game meant to you and what being on that team meant to who you are, how you've grown up as a person, that's much more beneficial than saying, we scored and we made it to whatever, all states. I don't really, I was a musician, so I can't really help you there. <laughs> um, so I don't really know what that means. I think it's a great thing, but I'd rather hear, like, I played football, I used to have social anxiety, or, you know, I just was a quiet person, or I, you know, needed to 
learn how to weight lift, joining the football team helped me do X, Y, and Z. I'd much rather hear that rather than just a generic story. Um, and I think, I'm hoping most of us agree. And then if you have any issues that you've had in your time at school in the four years, I would use that um, additional questions or like the additional comment section to talk about it. You can absolutely talk about it in your essay, and I've read some very lovely essays describing that time in your life. But if you feel like you've written a really great and solid essay, but you, you know you really do want to mention that, I definitely would put that down because for a lot of us that do holistic, um, meetings, we bring that into it and say, hey, this kid might have not have done well sophomore year, but they had X, Y, and Z issue, and this is why, and that will definitely help us with reading your application. I would also mention, uh, make sure you're applying for the correct term. Uh, we get a lot of applications that are for the wrong semester. So an applicant who's applying for fall 2018, but submitted a spring 2018 uh, application instead. Um, every one of our uh, financial uh, offices, our bursar's offices, are going to be different in terms of if we can offer refunds or things like that for your application fees. So please make sure you are applying for the correct semester. And the right schools. If you're putting a resume, like, don't put, I'm applying to BC, yes. and then send it to UMass <laughs> Boston. It's really embarrassing for you. I see that a lot All in the the personal time. essays, especially to writing about your first choice college. Just make sure you're differentiating that. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to have common <coughs> application to make your life easier, but don't make it too easy on yourself. Read that all the way through. It will definitely go a long way, and uh, it makes for an awkward conversation with the guidance counselor and I sometimes, so <laughs> definitely make sure to double check that. Uh, and I was gonna say, in terms of the essay, I like Daisy was saying, we wanna learn something about you, whether it's an impactful experience. Um, the biggest trouble I have when I get to an essay where I feel like I can't connect is when you wrote about someone who impacted your life, but I didn't learn anything about you. So I want to know why did they impact your life? Um, you know, sometimes we'll get stories about an amazing grandparent who did wonderful things, and we get a whole bio on that person, and then I never learned anything about what's inspiring you by that person or from that person. So, um, you know, it's totally okay to talk about those things, but include at least a paragraph about what that means for your own life, too. Thank you. Uh, I think the, the constant message there is when you're done with the application, show it to somebody to review it, <laughs> at least one person, we'll maybe your counselor, that. before you send it in. Um, could you guys talk about, I think we have, I think BC has ED, correct? No, not anymore? Oh, so no one here has ED, right? Uh, could, could one of you or two of you go over the different deadlines? Uh, we might have covered it in the classroom, but I know I was really quick with it. Um, did we already cover it? Somewhat? Okay. <laughs> so we have different deadlines, right? Yes. Well, you, why don't you guys quickly, if one of you could just explain what e early action, early decision, regular rolling, that kind of stuff. Sure. So typically there's, there's usually three different kinds. One is early decision, early action, Okay, there's four, yeah. sorry. <laughs> right? Early decision, early action, regular decision, and rolling. So early decision or early action, um, those happen earlier in a senior year. Usually deadlines are maybe November 1st, November 15th, maybe a December 1, it depends on the institution. Early decision is a binding contractual application. If you apply ED to a school, in addition to sending them your application, you're also going to send them a contract that you sign and your counselor signs that says basically, if admitted, I will enroll. So um, I don't know if BC was ever ED, but we've never had it in my 12 years there. Um, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I've never worked at an institution that has early decision, but that's my understanding of it. Early action is where you can apply early in your senior year, but it's a non-binding application, meaning that if you apply early action to a school and you're accepted to that school, usually in December of your senior year, you have until May 1st to decide if you wish to go there or not. Um, Regular decision is where you apply usually around January 1st, January 15th if the school has a deadline. And then um, rolling admission is where a school doesn't have a deadline and you could apply in November or December or March or April. The thing with a rolling decision school that you wanna make sure is that the, the, the more into senior year you get, 
if a school reaches the number of applications or enrollees that they need, they might stop accepting applications. So you start to roll the dice a little bit when you get into like February, March of your senior year. Um, but that's the way that rolling admission is tended to work. So the complicated, the more complicated thing about this is that multiple, each institution might have two or three of these different deadlines. It depends on the institution. So it's a little bit of work to do in your visits when you're hopefully visiting campuses and hearing from admission counselors um, in an interview, in an information session on a campus tour. Um, but you can certainly ask those questions. And um, my advice, as dorky as this is, take notes. Because you may think you'll remember, but I can guarantee you won't. Because mm -hmm. you visit two campuses in one day, and we all start to blend together as yep. different as our campuses <laughs> are um, so no one ever listens to me I don't see a lot of people at BC taking notes but it is a good idea so I definitely advise you're that. like which one has Quidditch and which one does it right <laughs> all of us uh, we're rolling so we are early action we are a rolling admissions school and with that caveat of the rolling admission yes it's a little bit more flexible but um, you know, be reasonable within your time frames. If you're applying to our school in March, that's putting so much more pressure on you when your classmates are starting to begin to deposit and we do follow a recommended deposit deadline of May 1st, you're really limiting that window of time. And if you're getting into those conversations about affordability and financial aid and how do I make this all happen, that's a really hard thing to do in eight weeks. So mm -hmm. just take some strong consideration to that. So yes, I will absolutely read your application March 15th, but I'm also going to try to beg you to come to campus so we can sit down and really start getting the ball rolling because I'm trying to get you up to speed with everyone who's been applying since September, October, November, December, and so forth. So, I'd add a quick disclaimer if you're looking at different regions um, across the country. In the South, for instance, there are a number of institutions that have an October 15th early deadline. Mm -hmm. So you've only been in school for about a month before those deadlines are coming up. So this is definitely something that you'll want to be taking those notes on um, during your tours while you're doing research on the summer so that as you're you know, just getting started into your senior year, you might already have a deadline coming up quick. Another thing about deadlines to keep in mind is that it may have an uh, impact on the amount of scholarships you get, particularly when it comes to merit-based scholarships. Um, each school probably has a, well, depending on the school, may have finite resources that they're working with when it comes to scholarships. So the earlier you get your application in, if you are um, operating under an early action deadline, um, the more likely that it is that you will have a scholarship, perhaps, if you meet the criteria. And obviously, the later, the longer you wait in the calendar year, um, they're, they may just run out of money. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And really think and thank your guidance counselors because honestly the amount of work that they have to do in order to make sure that your applications go out in time is tremendous. So you might say, yeah, this deadline's October 15th. I'm gonna go to my guidance office October 1st and ask for my transcript. It's not gonna work that way. Um, or I'm gonna ask for a letter of recommendation a week before. Really, really think about it. Plan everything properly. They're working over the summers and everything just to make sure that all of your information goes out as quickly as they can. They're calling us on the phone, advocating for you guys. Um, so give them a Dunkin' Donuts gift card when you graduate because they've really done a lot for you. Yeah. I was going to say one more thing to make sure if you are taking SATs again in the fall, just make sure that you're building in some time for the score reports to get sent. College Board is notoriously like a three week plus turnaround for us to even see a score report. So if you are trying to hit that December 1st deadline, you took the November 4th SATs and you have Thanksgiving in the middle of all that, it could get really dicey. So just make sure that your SAT deadlines, I would say, line up at least a month or two before probably, honestly, two months before your deadline actually hits, just to be safe. And you're hearing a lot about deadlines. It's nice to know that within the common application for at least those schools uh, in Naviance, once schools are loaded in, um, the deadlines all kind of fill in right there. So it's yeah. a nice, easy way to help, uh, help stay organized. Um, if I think a number of you have early action and regular type deadlines, um, could you cover like the the profile of an applicant who maybe should or should not apply to that early action deadline, because I know that's a tough one um, for us sometimes in the fall. 
So for us, our early action deadline is our most competitive time. Um, again, nursing majors do have to apply by early action, so that means they're in a really incredibly competitive pool. Um, this year, I believe our nursing applicants and the school as a whole for early action was an average around a 3.9 GPA with around a 1300 SAT score. So that's who you're looking, looking to basically compete against. As we said, it is academically competitive. So if you're not sure if your scores are there, then you might try waiting till regular decision. I believe Walpole, a lot of students did apply early action, which was great. Um, I read a lot of those applications this year. So, but really think about it when you're applying. But what's great is that a lot of schools, if you don't get in for early action, you might get deferred to regular decision. So that's a more lax time um, and that the standards have dropped a little bit. So it's not like, okay, I have to have that perfect SAT score in order to get in. It's, it's a lot different. Um, at BC, we have an early action deadline of November 1st and a regular decision deadline of January 1st. Uh, similar to UMass Lowell, early action for us is a little more competitive to be admitted to BC. For us, the reason for that is that we've made a commitment to only enroll 30% of our eventual freshman class from our early action pool. At the same time that we've made that enrollment decision, the pool of applicants that we get each year at early action are among the most competitive and accomplished students that we'll see throughout the year. So those two things working together does make it a little bit more competitive to be admitted. So one of the things that I always tell families is, you know, remember that for us, 70% of our freshman class comes from regular decision. And I always think of regular decision as an opportunity to strengthen your application. You know, by applying in January, it gives you the opportunity to, if you do no one wants to take the SAT or ACT again, but if you're planning to do that, to try and increase your scores, you have time to complete that testing. And then applying in January also gives your school the opportunity to send some grades along from your work in senior year. So in the fall of your senior year, if you're in a really challenging curriculum and you're doing really well, getting really strong grades, it just makes sense that it makes your application stronger to submit grades along with your application from senior year. So that's why I always think of just Regular decision just gives you the time to strengthen your application. And I think sometimes there's a real frenzy today around this early thing and like I have to be applying early somewhere and where are you applying early and I got in early and there's all this stuff about early and uh, I mean maybe then it's the name regular decision it doesn't even sound good it's just regular I mean, maybe we need to rename the name yeah. of that um, but I think the, the real takeaway is that you know if you think your application might be stronger by waiting and giving us more academic information then certainly take that time because one of the best things you can do and we get asked all the time you know what can I do to stand out what can I do to strengthen my application and the best thing you can do is first and foremost send us the strongest application and if that can be done by taking a little bit more time then again forget what everybody else is saying about early follow your gut i'm going to stick with that theory okay. like that yeah so at nichols we're a little bit uh unique in the ways that you can apply to our school so we actually start off our early action season very early so we have in august uh, event where we allow uh, students to come to campus to receive an admissions decision before the start of our senior year. This is roughly about 100 applicants of over 2,000 applications we'll get, so keep in mind this is a pretty small number in comparison to the entire cycle. But if you're a really strong student, I would say at well over a 3.0 GPA, and we would feel confident waiving some of these senior year requirements like a letter of recommendation that you might not otherwise be getting until September or those first sets of grades, um, you can come to our campus and potentially drive home with an admissions decision that day. So that's a one day opportunity that we started offering about three years ago. It's been really uh, successful for us in helping uh, build up our class and giving an opportunity to a student who maybe has visited Nichols a couple of times in their junior year and they're feeling really confident about us to go ahead and take that next step right away. Um, after that, we are still early action through December 1st and then we go into the rolling admissions phase from there. Um, we're definitely more competitive at the early action, but I always like and confidently say to families, if you're really unsure about applying early, at least for Nichols, go for it because I will defer you into rolling admission and if I need to see more information. So if I need to see a second set of grades, I'm going to be really candid with you and open with you in that process. Keep in mind though, every school is different though. So follow a little bit of what Kelly is saying and talk to those schools too about, is it in my benefit to apply early or do I take the extra time and wait? So. Yes, yes. 
So I'm just going to take a couple of seconds just to plug our, uh, our deadline dates. Uh, so for early action for UMass Boston, it is November 1st. And like I said earlier, if you're interested in nursing, that is uh, the deadline um, for nursing interested students. Uh, our regular deadline is March 1st. March 1st, sorry. Um, and in terms of uh, early action, very similar to everyone else in terms of uh, the type of student, very high achieving, uh, definitely is the most competitive. But we also uh, provide a commitment to you all that if you apply it by our early action date, that you'll hear from us about a decision um, by January 1st. So there's also that buy-in for you all to get your application and so you potentially know where you are going uh, by the new year. And put all these deadlines in your calendar, just so you're not confusing schools. I hear a lot of students will call me and say, hey, like I'm ready for your March decision. And we're like, no, we have a February 1st decision. You're thinking about UMass Boston. Um, so make sure you put those deadlines in your calendar, get that notification a week before, some, well, hopefully a month before, so you can start panicking then. <laughs> Don't panic. Um, rather than waiting till the last minute and then realizing, because I know when I was applying to schools, I accidentally thought that BU's deadline was a certain date, and I completely missed it so make sure you put those in your calendar technology makes things way easier now and I just echo um, Kelly's comment about kind of going with your gut um, in terms of applying and applying early so for us our application deadlines are much earlier than uh, many schools you'll be looking at in New England October 15th is our early action deadline and December 1st is our regular decision deadline but if you're a student who um, you know if perhaps that later um, deadline might do you better or the holistic review process that kind of um, extends that early answer, uh, get, kind of know that about yourself. So if submitting that application early is only gonna cause you more anxiety that you might have to wait um, and get a letter that says, oh no, you still have to wait, it's okay to submit that application um, later down the road. Uh, but if you're someone who, you know what, I need, I, I gotta get this to-do list done, I need to get it in and I can wait on it and it's okay if I wait later, knowing what's gonna happen in the process, um, I think that's really important because senior year can be so hectic and crazy. You're trying to keep track of all these college applications, you have homework and projects due um, you know, during the school day and you should still be able to enjoy this, your senior year. It's your last year in high school and um, you certainly don't want all that stress and anxiety to take away um, from being involved in your extracurriculars or you know hanging out with your friends and just enjoying the last few months that you have here in your hometown um, so knowing yourself and how those deadlines best fit for you and your personality and just the way you're able to manage it I think is really important to have a bit more of a smooth sailing last year so it was a college counselor part of the time, you can see how hard it is for us to be experts in what we do because each of them, each, each institution is very different in a lot of things that they do. And when you think you got it down, they change it the next year. Um, so just keep that in mind. But that kind of leads me to my next question because, uh, you know, there, there become lots of questions will come up. Uh, and a lot of them we can help with in our office, but sometimes they're very specific answers that you need to go to the institution for. Uh, do you guys have any suggestions for applicants communicating with you or communicating with your institution? First things first, check the website. Um, because nine times out of 10, the answer is on the website. There are the times where it's not. So I know with our institution, we more than happily take phone calls as well as emails. Um, the admissions office has a general email, but all of the counselors also have specific emails as well. You can try to figure out who's in your region or you can just email basically anybody. But we are also on social media as well. So if you want us to shoot, shoot us a message on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, feel free to do that. If you have a recruiter who is coming to your school who you've met with face to face, um, make sure you get their cards and contact them directly because they'll probably have a, at least some idea of what, uh, who you may be in general, but also uh, there may be some similar questions that are coming from a specific place. Um, so definitely contact your specific recruiter if you have one. I was going to say we love hearing from the student. Um, it's really great hearing from the parents, but um, being a student owning the application process, I do think really goes one step further. So, you know, don't be afraid as a student to make those phone calls. Your mom and dad don't have to make that phone call for you. Actually, funny story, I did get a voicemail this past year from a parent who um, switched names and decided to pretend to be the student halfway through the voicemail. So <laughs> that was uh, really interesting and <laughs> hilarious. 
but I would have equally called back either, but <laughs> don't be afraid to be a student because, you know, it's just so great to hear from you because it is your application at the end of the day. I don't call and say, hi, I was filling out my student's application, and we're like, don't yeah. say that. <laughs> Uh, and, and again, I think um, we're going we, we're, we're to have a financial aid night and senior night in, in, in the fall next year. Um, but if one of you could just quickly give the, the basic overview of like when, how uh, people apply for financial aid. It's so never too early to hear, to hear that. Yeah. So financial aid, um, if you are interested in need-based aid, uh, you can apply via the FAFSA form. That's going to open up October 1st. And it's going to use your parents' prior, prior tax returns um, to process that. So like I said, open um, October 1st. And uh, it's really important that you get that in um, really as soon as you can, because financial aid, the Office of Financial Aid at each of our institutions needs that information in order to package you uh, for their aid package. When it comes to merit-based scholarships, at least for UMass Boston, you are automatically considered for merit-based scholarships. Um, we are going to use your SAT or ACT scores and your GPA to figure that out. Um, and in terms of UMass Boston, our chart that we use and the award amounts is public on our website. So you can see sort of where you may fall in that range. Um, and given time uh, at the moment, I think we'll shift to some questions from the audience if anyone has any questions. Um, I know we didn't cover everything. I'm sure there's things that you have questions about. So I think Mrs. Dolan is, uh, has a microphone if, there, if there's anyone out there. I can't see, so. Raise your hand if you have a question. Where's she going? She's leaving. She's done. Look at her. Oh, questions from the booth? No, her microphone's dead. Oh. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for the panel or anyone on the panel? Oh, we have someone here. The question was when can we start the common application? August 1st. Okay. That's a good time to start. <laughs> <laughs> Although I believe you can start sooner and it will retain the information yes. yeah. for the following year as well. Is so it could. this year or next year? So August 1st of, this year? Yeah. Of this year. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. So if someone applies to early action and does not get accepted, do they have an opportunity then add to a supplement to the application that kind of go through the process as is? So if you get deferred, you do. Um, if it's a straight deny, you can ask for your application to be reevaluated um, and send in as much information as you have. So if you have any new grades, I know Ju freshman through junior year is kind of tough, but if you want to send in first semester senior year grades or anything that you can, we definitely would love to see that, um, as well as any new information that you have. If you took the SATs again, we would love to see that. Um, and then if you have like a stellar letter of recommendation that happens to be from the president of the UMass system, um, then absolutely put that into your, because they happen to be your neighbor, Marty Meehan, um, <laughs> then feel free to send that along as well, because we'd love to learn more about you so that we can kind of see where you fit into our application pool. Yeah, I think the answer to this question is going to be really institution specific. There are some institutions that for early, if they're not admitted, they'll just defer everyone and they don't deny anyone at early action. That's an institution decision. Um, we do deny people yeah. at early action. That's <laughs> an awful statement to say, but it's true. Um, we only deny students who are really falling in the very bottom part of our pool, and we know that decision would be the same whether it's early or whether it's regular, and we think it's more fair to let that student and family know that at that time. Um, for us, we do not have an appeal process for someone who's been denied at early or at regular. The only time we would ever go back and re-review an application is if we had erroneous information in the original application for example, if grades are wrong on a transcript or something like that. So um, those kinds of things will be really institution specific, but I think you know, for a lot of institutions, being deferred to the regular pool is, is 
quite a large possibility if you're not admitted early action. And then what that institution is looking for will also be kind of institution specific. It's a really, I think sometimes if you're looking, we talked a little bit earlier about connecting with a school and connecting with an admission office and how do you reach out to them. And sometimes maybe you're looking to kind of ask a question and you don't have a question to ask. If this happens, this is a great question to ask. Like, I've been deferred, what else can I do? Or, you know, I've been offered a place on the wait list, what, what can I do? Those are great questions for students and parents to be asking so that not only you inform, but you're also making that connection with an admission office. Anyone else have a question? I have one. <laughs> um, <laughs> what can parents start doing now to help prepare their children for college beyond the application process? <laughs> um, I would say uh, for me, like as a student, what worked best um, in speaking with many families kind of in the last several years working on this side is setting aside like a specific day of the week or a specific time frame of the month where you'll have that college search conversation so it's not what's happening in every car ride as you're picking up your kids from practice or dropping them off at a friend's house. I know it is conversation that you want to be having and it's certainly on the top of your kids' minds um, throughout the year, but it can also be a very stressful thing that this is the only thing anyone and everyone is asking them. So setting aside a certain amount of time, you know, however that works in your schedule to say, okay, this is the time when we're going to have these conversations and outside of that time frame, we're just regular mom, dad, kid um, going about our day. And I think um, that can be helpful and just tempering some of that stress throughout the whole process. Thank you. I, if I can add to that, I think one of the things we all say in this process from this side of the desk is, you know, we want students to own this process and we want them to advocate for themselves and we want them to come in and talk to us and we want them to schedule the visit and you probably want them to schedule the visit too. But the reality, <laughs> we have to live in the real world and like some students just aren't going to pick up the ball and you're going to have to do certain things and you know, if, if your student is not the kind of student who's ever going to go online and make an appointment to go for a campus tour, then you're going to have to do that, right? But the reality is when you get to that campus and you walk into the admission office, if they don't walk up to the front desk on their own, you push them. Yeah. Because that's where you can really let them start to do it. It might be scary for them. It might be hard for them, depending upon how they're wired. You know, it, it's an interesting psychological study to watch students and families come into an admission office because there are some who literally, it's almost like the student's not there and the, <laughs> hey, there's mom and she's here and we're here and we're applying and they're just so happy. And you're kind of like, where's the kid at? Like who, who's applying here? Um, and then there's other people who just, they look like they don't want to be there. There's people sleeping in your sessions. I'm always confused about that because I'm like, we didn't ask you to come. You made this appointment on your own. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot that can happen when you get there. And I think that's where, you know, you can really start to help them take this process by the horns and own it a little bit more. And if it means that you push them up to the front desk, then that's what you do. And if it means you have to pull yourself back, then that's what you do. But I think really when you get to the visit is when you can start helping them to own this process a little bit. And sometimes it seems like parents are ventriloquists and their kids are just talking, <laughs> but the parents are really the ones asking the questions. Um, and I definitely agree with having your student um, ask the questions and be direct. But it, if you have questions too, and we're more than willing to answer those for you as well, um, but we really would rather see the bulk of those questions come from the student, because we know you're nervous, and for some, some of you, this is your first kid going off to college, and you really just want to learn a lot more. Um, so we're here to help your student, but we're also here to help you. So if you want to call us, and you're like, I'm not sure, we can't give you as much information as we can your student. Um, so really do be that guy, that guiding hand without actually being the person doing all of the work. And look at how all of us are. We like to talk, we like to engage. You can tell that from us being on the panel. For students here, if you're nervous about talking to us and it's okay to be, just bite the bullet and start talking. And if you're nervous, we'll help you. It's part of what we've learned how to do for our job. What is really bad is when your mom is sitting there asking all the questions and you're sitting there like this. <laughs> With the cell phone. With the cell phone. What, what is this saying? This is saying, I'm not interested in you, I'm not interested yep. in your school, I'm not interested in being here, I didn't want to come. And that may be the case, mom and dad, if you made them go. And 
actually there's students at BC whose parents dragged them there and they ended up coming, they've ended up having a great time. So it's not necessarily a worthless visit, but it's not the best first impression, right? So, you know, even if you're nervous, don't act like you're too cool for school be a little bit nervous, be a little bit vulnerable, and we're gonna help you through it, because it's, it's what we do. We don't get special training, we're just kind of born like this, and we gravitate towards the profession, yeah. and then we help you with it. I was gonna say some schools do offer like an overnight opportunity or a visit opportunity that doesn't include the parent, and that's a really great way to test drive it and see if this works, because you are taking this on for four years of your life, maybe more, depending on the program, so, go for that overnight. Maybe you're someone who doesn't like to be away from home, but um, I can tell you that the next morning you're gonna be really happy with yourself and really proud that you took that extra step to do it without your mom or dad. And likewise too, as a parent, don't be afraid. Um, you know, maybe you've seen the campus, but you wanna go one more time just by yourself. We'll gladly take you on a tour. We have many parents who come without a student and that might be a great way to get your own parental lens on too and not just feel like you're asking questions on behalf of your student, but you're asking questions on behalf of yourself because you're just as much a part of the process. And I just would like to, while we're talking about the students, I want to acknowledge if, if all the students here could stand up for one second. I'm not gonna call you out by name or anything like that. <laughs> just stand up for one second. This is a first. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to acknowledge the students that are here tonight that have taken the first step in taking a leadership role in this entire process. Um, <laughs> even though some of you were dragged here by your parents, you're still here and getting some good information. Um, but thank you, you guys can sit down. But I'm glad you were here and I hope it was helpful. I hope it was helpful to the parents. Uh, but we all, we need to thank our panel for being here tonight and being so great.